Thank you. We all ask big questions. Why is the world filled with woe? How can we make it better? How do we give meaning and purpose to our lives? These are difficult and profound questions, and some people believe they have the answers to them. For example, morality is dictated by God and holy scriptures, and the world will be better when everyone obeys his laws. The world's problems are the fault of a certain kind of evil people who must be defeated and punished. One tribe of people is inherently worthy. It should have power and prestige implemented by a strong leader who channels its authentic virtue. At some time in the past, there was a well-ordered state, then alien forces subverted this harmony and led to decadence and degeneration. Only a heroic vanguard with memories of the old ways can restore the society to its golden age. Well, what about the rest of us? Uh, in a forthcoming book called Enlightenment Now, I argue that there is an alternative system of beliefs and values, the ideals of the Enlightenment. That, uh, in a nutshell, that we can use knowledge to enhance human flourishing. Now, many people embrace Enlightenment ideals without being able to name or describe them. For that reason, they tend to fade into the background. They become the status quo or the establishment. And whereas other ideologies have passionate advocates, the ideals in the, of the Enlightenment lack clear champions. I argue that they need a positive defense and an explicit commitment. There are four themes to the Enlightenment. Reason, science, humanism, and progress. Let me say a few words about each. It all begins with reason. Reason is non-negotiable. As soon as you try to provide reasons why we should distrust reason, as soon as you try to provide reasons for anything, if you claim that you're right in what you say, that other people should believe you, that you're not lying, or that you're not full of baloney, you have lost the argument because you have appealed to reasons and appealed to a common standard of rationality that you expect your audience to accept. Now, human beings on their own are not particularly reasonable, to put it mildly. Uh, cognitive psychologists have shown that we are likely to generalize from anecdotes, to seek evidence that confirms our beliefs and dismiss evidence that disconfirms them, we project stereotypes onto individuals, and we're overconfident about our knowledge, our wisdom, and our rectitude. However, human beings are capable of reason, particularly if we set up norms and institutions that refine our collective wisdom, such as free speech, open debate and criticism, logical analysis, fact-checking, and empirical testing. Which brings me to the second ideal of the Enlightenment, Science. Science begins from the realization that traditional sources of belief are generators of delusion. Faith, revelation, tradition, authority, charisma, mysticism, conventional wisdom, gut feelings, subjective certainty, hermeneutic parsing of sacred tests, these are all recipes for being wrong. Uh, instead, the path to knowledge is to try, formulate possible explanations and to test them against reality. Science, we know, is our most reliable means of understanding the world, including ourselves. An important Enlightenment ideal is that there can be a science of human nature and that beliefs about society and politics and history can be testable. The third Enlightenment theme is humanism. The, that the ultimate moral purpose is to reduce the, su the suffering and enhance the flourishing of men, women, and children. That is, their life, health, happiness, knowledge, richness of experience. Now, when you say that, it may sound obvious or unexceptionable or banal or even saccharine, but indeed, it is anything but. There are alternatives to humanism. It is by no means obvious. Many alternative ideologies hold that the ultimate good is to enhance the glory of the tribe or the nation or the race or the class or the faith instead of individual human beings. To achieve feats of heroic greatness, to advance a mystical force, a dialectical struggle, or the pursuit of a utopian or messianic age. To obey the dictates of a divinity and pressure others to do the same. 
Now, humanism is feasible because people are endowed with a sense of sympathy. We have the capacity to feel each other's pain, to express a concern with one another's welfare. Unfortunately, by default, our circle of sympathy is rather small. We extend it to our blood relatives, our close friends and allies, cute little fuzzy baby animals, and not much else. <laughs> However, our circle of sympathy can be expanded through cosmopolitanism, through education, through journalism, through art, through mobility, and through reason, the realization that I can't say that my interests are more important than yours just because I'm me and you're not, and hope for you to take me seriously. So um, the final Enlightenment ideal is that progress is possible if we apply knowledge to try to enhance human flourishing. So how did that Enlightenment hope for progress work out? Well, as it happens, this is an empirical hypothesis. Dimensions of human well-being can be measured. Uh, longevity, health, sustenance, wealth, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge. If they have increased over time, that is progress. Let's take a look. The first graph that I'm going to show plots human life expectancy from uh, 1760 to the present. And basically, it shows that a couple of hundred years ago, the life expectancy of a human on Earth was about 30. Today, it is 70, 80 in the richer parts of the world, and displaying a pattern that one sees over and over again in measuring human progress. The first departure from universal poverty and wretchedness and misery and disease uh, took place in uh, Western Europe, followed by the Americas, but then Asia, uh, has caught up, and Africa is closing the gap. Uh, an African today lives as long as a European did in the 1930s. Much of this has been driven by advances in child mortality. Even in a wealthy country like Sweden, 250 years ago, one-third of children died before their fifth birthday. The rate of infant mortality plunged to close to zero in Sweden, followed by the North American countries, Asian countries, Latin American countries, and once again, Africa is starting to close the gap. Maternal mortality. Uh, 250 years ago, the, uh, a woman who was pregnant had the same death rate as a woman with breast cancer today. That was decimated in Sweden, again, followed by the United States, and a country in Asia, Malaysia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Sustenance. Famine is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and every region of the world used to be susceptible to famine. This graph shows that since the uh, 1860s, the rate of famines has uh, unevenly plummeted. It still exists in some parts of the world, but at a fraction of historical levels. Undernourishment in the poorer parts of the world has been decreasing in Latin America, Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Prosperity. The entire world used to be poor. Then the UK made the great escape from universal poverty, again followed by Asia, Latin America, China, and India. As a result, uh, extreme poverty, the uh, inability to feed one's family, has decreased from 90% in 1820 to about 10% today, and the United Nations has set the goal of eliminating extreme poverty from the face of the earth by the 2030s. May we live to see the day. Peace. The, this graph shows the percentage of years in which the great powers fought each other uh, over the span of the last 500 years. And as you can see, 500 years ago, the great powers were always at war. Uh, nowadays, they are never at war. Uh, this graph zooms in on the period since the end of World War II, and it shows that the world has got, been on something of a uh, roller coaster in terms of war deaths, with peaks for the Korean War, Vietnam, Iran, Iraq, and Syria but each peak is lower than the previous ones and the overall tendency is downward. Safety. Uh, the United States has reduced its rate of violent crime by 50% in the last 20 years, and the world itself has reduced the rate of homicide, counting all countries together, by about 30% just in the last 15 years. Violence against women, at least in countries like the United States, which have good data, uh, it, is down, both uh, rape and sexual assault and intimate partner violence, as is uh, violence against children, both 
uh, bullying and other forms of violent victimization at school, physical abuse, <laughs> sexual abuse. Knowledge. Uh, 200 years ago, uh, only about 10% of the world was literate. That figure is now approaching 100%, as is access to basic education, a primary education in the first few years of high school. Finally, most relevant for this audience, freedom and rights have been uh, increasing. Despite the some obvious backsliding in countries like Turkey and Russia and Venezuela, despite lamentations that uh, democracy is in recession, this graph, which shows the world's score for democracy versus autocracy, indicates that the world has never been more democratic than it is uh, today. 250 years ago, there were a handful of democracies encompassing about 1% of the world's population. Today, a majority of countries are more democratic than autocratic, and a majority of the world's population lives in them. In particular, in the 1970s, there were about 31 democracies. By 1989, there were 50. By the beginning of uh, Barack Obama's term in 2009, there were 87 democracies. Today, there are 103. This graph shows a uh, estimate by the scholar Christopher Farris of human rights protection across the world. This is the Oslo Freedom Forum, and it's appropriate place to point out that Norway has always had the world's best record in human rights protection. But even starting from its advantaged position, human rights protection has increased since 1949 in uh, Norway. Uh, looking at some of the worst places on Earth for human rights protection, China and North Korea, uh, we see that in 1949, North Korea and South Korea were not very different in human rights protection. Uh, South Korea has drastically increased. South, North Korea has gotten worse. China is another one of the worst violators. But even China is better off than it was during the, the uh, murderous totalitarian regime of Mao Zedong. Here we see the graph for the world as a whole. And what we see is that the arc of history bends toward justice too slowly, but the uh, it is going in the right direction. Particular policies have uh, implemented advances in human rights. Country after country has decriminalized homosexuality, despite some famous uh, exceptions in Africa and Russia. Capital punishment has been abolished in country after country. If current trends continue, capital punishment would vanish from the face of the earth by 2026. And all of this has been propelled by a, a, an increase in liberal values. Hard as it may be to believe, including acknowledging events in this country, but in every region of the world, support for the rights of women, the rights of gay people, rights of racial minorities, and democratic participation has increased, most obviously in, the, in uh, North, Northern and Western Europe and the Americas. But we can see that in every region, including the least liberal parts of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, the Islamic world, there has been an increase in support for liberal values. Some of it, this occurs because people get more liberal over time. More of it occurs because uh, each generation is more liberal than the one that came before it. There's a saying that, in, that science makes progress funeral by funeral. Uh, that is also true of human rights protection. Well, how is the fact of human progress reflected in the news? This graph shows the tone of the news calculated by a computer algorithm of how optimistic versus pessimistic the news reports are. And what it shows is both the New York Times and a composite of the world's news media have gotten more and more pessimistic, more and more morose, even as the world has gotten better and better and better. What it reminds us of is that the news is a systematically misleading way to understand the world. Now, how do humans intuitively assess risk? The brilliant psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman pointed out that we have installed in us a bug called the availability heuristic. Namely, the easier it is to remember or imagine an example, the more likely we think that kind of event is. That's why people fear plane crashes and shark attacks and nuclear accidents, which kill almost nobody, more than car crashes falling down the stairs or using a generator indoors, which kill lots and lots of people. Now, what happens when the availability heuristic in the human brain is fed by the news? 
Well, what is news? News is stuff that happens, not stuff that doesn't happen. Uh, if you combine the availability heuristic with the nature of the news, you get the impression that the world is more dangerous than it ever has been, and no matter what year you look at, people will always have that impression. Now, is progress inevitable? The answer is, of course not. Uh, solutions create new problems, and we always are vulnerable to nasty surprises. The world wars, the crime boom from the 60s to the 80s, AIDS in Africa, uh, authoritarianism in Russia, Turkey, Eastern Europe, uh, and elsewhere. Progress is not a law of nature, but it is a gift of pursuing the ideals of the Enlightenment, reason, science, and humanism. Human effort is not futile, and despite the headlines, humanity has made tremendous progress, and there is reasonable hope for much more. Thank you very much.